Medicare is complicated. Medicare can be confusing. Medicare is no fun to study. Will you know what decisions to make when Medicare time arrives for you? My name is Doug Jones, and I wrote a book to help you figure it all out. Medicare for the Lazy Man. It's on sale at Amazon and BarnesandNoble.com. Also, you can download and listen to my podcast, Medicare for the Lazy Man, wherever fine podcasts are given away free of charge. Medicare for the Lazy Man, simplest and easiest guide ever. Possibly the greatest podcast ever, it's the Medicare for the Lazy Man podcast. The Medicare podcast using a big block Chevy for power. He takes a half hour to cook minute rice, it's Medicare expert Doug Jones. Well, hello again, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us today at the Medicare for the Lazy Man podcast. My Canadian nephew, Drew McMillan, may have told you who I am. I'm Doug Jones, your Medicare expert. Some people tell me I should say that I'm a Medicare specialist, because who can really be expert with a a massive subject like Medicare? But I try. I do what I can. And I try to convey my Medicare knowledge to my acquaintances, my listeners, and my clients. And the way that I do that is by virtue of my book. I wrote a book called Medicare for the Lazy Man. The current edition is 2023. So if you go to barnesandnoble.com or if you go to amazon.com and put Medicare for the Lazy Man 2023 into the search window, you're going to find the current edition of the book. And especially at Amazon, you're going to find uh, an amazing plethora of selections by which you can enjoy the content of the book. You can take the uh, audio book and listen to me tell you about all the Medicare knowledge. You can take the Kindle version, the ebook. And uh, for a very small amount of money, all of that knowledge will appear on your reader. You can buy the workhorse of the whole um, collection of books, and that's the paperback. At uh, Amazon, that's about an $8 item. And then if you want to be really hoity-toity and you want to show off to your friends and neighbors, here's what I would suggest that you do. Buy the $22 hardcover version of Medicare for the Lazy Man. 2023. It's got the same exciting content. The illustrations are in color. And if you finish and you decide that uh, you've retained all the knowledge that you need from that $22 item, you can wrap it up in gift wrapping, put a pretty ribbon around it, and it becomes a gift for one of your friends or relatives. So in any event, I would say join the human race that's approaching that part of the human race approaching Medicare by purchasing Medicare for the Lazy Man 2023, and you will you will have your mind set at ease as to what you need to do. And then it will uh, also be apparent <clears throat> how you can contact me to help you through that transition to Medicare. You're going to need some additional insurance. Generally speaking, I can provide that for you inexpensively, and uh, I would be happy to do that. You and I will then join hands and skip across that Medicare threshold out into the blissful land of Medicare, where uh, you will have nothing but sweetness and light happen for the rest of your life. So that's my story and I'm sticking with it. And here's a person who's sticking with his story. I asked him where he had been lately and he's sitting on a beach in what looks to be a, a country I've never seen before. And I think he got there by burning. I, I saw a credit card bill for a bunch of jet fuel. And I'm wondering what the connection is. Randy, what's what's going on here? Well, I got caught. <laughs> oh, no. I, I, I meant to change out this, uh, you know, information, the background pictures and all that stuff on my on my machine here. And what you're seeing there, Doug, is uh, me on the beach at Puerto Vallarta. It looks like you're having fun. It looks like you're you're content and very very happy. I am not just for the you know the podcast audience. Doug has been you know reviewing my 
jet fuel bills very closely. And he keeps asking me where I'm going and where I've been and what my plans are. And I keep telling him, I'm working my way home here to Arizona. So well, I, I like the fact that the plane is getting a little exercise. I, God knows I've never <laughs> seen it. I've never been on it. I'm looking forward to that someday. But well, Randy Puerto says Vallarta he, is, Puerto Vallarta is closer to Cave Creek than Florida. Well, there you go. That's true. The last time we discussed this, you were in Panama, I think, if I recall yeah. correctly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so anyway, that's where I'm at. I, uh, I'm trying to keep all the, you know, the ocean wave sound as, you know, quiet as I can keep it because Doug is just getting a little testy about the fact that he's never gotten to have a ride on his plane. Plus this magnificent beach setting that you've got uh, behind you. I'm, I'm shocked that I'm even able to look away at my notes for today's episode, but I am. And unfortunately I have, somebody's got to do the work around here in order to pay the bills. I'll tell you that jet fuel that they don't give that stuff away. So to start out our episodes lately, I have delved into the the uh, product of the CDC. That's the government agency known as the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And of course, we would all like to think that they're all they're out there controlling and preventing diseases. But oh no, <laughs> they have a fairly sizable staff that is also trying to modify the English language. Yes, they've gone woke on us. I know that's hard to believe for a federal government agency, but uh, they have dictated that we must now change our method of using the English language to conform with what they think is going to make uh, their uh, various categories of people. And that's all they do is they like to separate categories of people. Uh, They want to make sure that we don't hurt anybody's feelings. And the category we're dealing with today is older adults. Randy and I know all too well what it's like to be an older adult in America, but that's not good enough for the CDC. They say that we should stop using terms like elderly. Well, I never use that. Senior. Randy hates that one. Oh, Randy's uh, got a comment. Share your comment, sir. They better reduce or at least eliminate the use of silver sneakers programs. Well, the word silver doesn't even appear on this list. So I think okay. we've right. we've already stopped using that. You, you know how much I hate silver oh, sneakers. <laughs> I, w- I was going to throw it in there knowing that you don't like silver, but we've got elderly and senior. They don't want us to use frail and fragile. I Frankly, I'm with them 100%. I think the CDC is right on the money here. I never use any of those words to describe me, to describe Randy, or anybody else in that age group. Um, but here's what they want us to use. Older adults or elders. They want us to, now didn't they have the word elder? Elderly. Okay, they said don't use elderly, but we can be called elders. Well, you know, <laughs> try that and uh, you're going to get my finger up your nose <clears throat> if you call me an elder. Um, and then the other suggestion they have, I think they had trouble coming up with a lot of suggestions, numeric age groups. So we we could be classified as persons age 55 to 64. Well, Randy and I are uh, looking at those years in our rearview rev- rev- mirror, so I don't know what they uh, – ours would be uh, much larger numbers. And uh, I say – to the uh, CDC, go, you know, um, pound sand. I think that's the uh, preferred nomenclature for um, what I would like to tell the CDC. There's a notation here. Tribes, American Indian and Alaskan Native urban communities and federal agencies define, and uh, they've got some other notations here. They define elders aged 55 plus years. So, If you are 55 years or older, be prepared for the CDC employees to be calling you elderly or define you as an elder. Uh, Frankly, that sickens me, but it doesn't take much. I got a com. I got a comment. Please share your comment. When they draw the line at 55 plus. Yes. That's, that's totally irrelevant. I've got, I've got socks that old. I know. And the thing is, um, when I was a kid, I might have thought 55 was old, but the older I've gotten, (laughs) the more I realize 55 is fairly youthful compared to um, a lot of the people in my age category that are hanging around today. 
And oh yeah, fun- I totally, I totally got it. Well, I just, I'll go ahead and mute myself out. I just wanted to make the point that fifty-five plus—that's nothing. Absolutely, and I got to tell you, silver. Don't ever use the word silver around Randy, because uh, I hate, the- I hate that term. I don't blame you. Well, let me tell you what our primary, um, uh, our primary content for the day. The content curator doesn't even know about this. I snuck this in. She's not here right now, so I decided on the content for this episode myself. And when she hears this episode in a couple of weeks, she may or may not be happy to hear about it. But what I thought we'd do during this. Uh, this uh, particular episode is I thought I would describe what happens if you as a potential person approaching Medicare asks the Medicare for the lazy man organization for uh, some assistance. And I talk about that a lot. I say, if you're approaching Medicare, I hope you'll read my book. I hope uh, I think you will understand much more about Medicare than you ever thought possible. And then I hope you'll contact me for assistance crossing that threshold into Medicare. And the reason that that becomes desirable for most people is that we have Medicare for most people, uh, Medicare parts A and B, but each of them has some cost sharing elements. And most people don't want to share any costs. They'd rather have insurance pay the vast majority of their bills so that they don't have any unpleasant surprises. The trade-off there is that they have to pay a premium uh, every month for the insurance that would cover those cost sharing elements. And so what I do is I tell people who are crossing into Medicare how they can acquire the very inexpensive insurance that will cover those gaps in Medicare. This is why they call Medicare supplement insurance also Medicare Medigap. And my goal in life is to help everybody crossing into Medicare acquire a Medicare supplement or a Medigap insurance policy and a drug plan that is specifically tailored to their particular needs. So let's back up a little bit. What happens? Somebody's read my book and they contact me and they say, I'm going to be turning 65 in a couple of months, or I'm going to be retiring from my job in a couple of months. Would you help me acquire the insurance that I need to cover the holes and the gaps in Medicare? And I say, of course I will. And typically what happens is people have gone to the website, MedicareForTheLazyMan.com, and they have found a questionnaire. Now, the questionnaire is going to ask them for some pieces of information that I would need in order to tell them what this insurance that they seek would cost them. So the information I need is going to be their date of birth. It's going to be their location, where their home is including the county, because some of my companies um, have their rates based on the county. Uh, Some of them have their rates based on a uh, a zip code, and some of them are a combination. It's, It's not always possible to tell. And then I ask whether these people have a um, a significant other living with them because some companies will give a discount for that. And then I ask whether this other person is a spouse. And I ask if that person is over 60 because some companies will offer discounts for those elements too. And so once I've gathered the information from the questionnaire, oh, one of the things I ask is, what is your phone number? And most people give me their cell number. And my next question is, may I text to this phone number? And most people say yes, but I imagine they're a little trepidatious because I don't want to hassle them, but the people don't know me yet. They don't, they haven't done business with me. They barely communicated with me. And so I, I can picture people saying yes with a little bit of trepidation. The reason that I want to know whether I can text to that person's telephone number is that it, when I send the quotation material by email, I have no idea whether it was received in good order or whether it went into a spam folder or whether it just never arrived at all. And so I want to text the person and say, hey, I have just sent some material in answer to your request to your email address. 
if it hasn't received been received, then go look in your spam folder. And that's all I use the text for. Unless they want to continue to communicate with me by text, I do not bug anybody with uh, either emails or repeated texts. So moving on, we now have a questionnaire. And down at the bottom of the questionnaire, the people are, have the option of asking questions or describing their personal situation. And um, I always like that because occasionally somebody will tell me something of interest. One that I received yesterday was a gentleman who's 50 years old, but he's eligible for Medicare supplement because he's been on the disabled list for two years. And so right now I'm working to help look for something in his state that would be a Medicare supplement that is um, designed for people under age 65. And as you might imagine, the insurance companies realize that those people that are on the disabled list have higher than average claim history, and they're not anxious to make a really um, uh, attractively priced product available. But that's just an example of what somebody might tell me about in the remarks column on the questionnaire. In any event, uh, they might tell me whether they've um, uh, worked past age 65 and now they're approaching retirement. And they would like to get the full coverage, uh, Medicare plus the Medicare supplement, plus the drug plan that I'm going to recommend. And they also often tell me what their health history is like. I don't need to know anybody's health history if they're applying in a timely manner because they have a special enrollment period <clears throat> that protects them against any, um, any negative consequences of having poor health. So what I do is I sit down with this information and I create a chart drawn from all of the companies that I use in a particular state. And these are all highly rated companies that I uh, find my quotes from. So what I do is I, I uh, take a form that I've developed and I write down the plan G rates for companies like Humana, Mutual of Omaha, United American, Aetna, Cigna, uh, and Anthem. And then I write down the high deductible plan G rates for those same companies. And this gives a wide range of quotes because I figure that sometimes the best company for a particular person might be the cheapest one. Other times, maybe the best company is a, uh, a different selection process. And I want to give my clients a wide range of uh, choices. And so that is one form that I'm going to send back to my client. It has quotes for plan G and then quotes for my favorite plan, high deductible plan G, which is a much less expensive product for a somewhat higher risk, but not that much higher. Now, page two of what I'm going to send back to my client is a description of why Plan G and plan high deductible plan G are the plans I've quoted. And at the top, it says plan G is the best Medicare insurance. And that is absolutely true. And then I say high deductible G is much less expensive. Could HDG, could high deductible plan G be the best plan for you? And it describes the fact that on a in a year with no medical expenses at all, Plan G is going to cost a lot more money. If you buy high deductible plan G and you have no medical expenses, you're likely to save a whole lot of money. Often that could be $100 a month. So at the end of the year, you'll have $1,200 more than you did at the beginning of the year if you've taken, if you've purchased high deductible plan G. And if you have uh, realized that savings, then uh, that's wonderful. That's a best case scenario. What about the worst case scenario? What if you have a year in which you have massive medical bills? Well, there is a ceiling. There is a limit to the extra risk that high deductible plan G represents. So in the worst possible year, you have for plan G, uh, you've got the regular premium, which is you know a little on the hefty side. And then in addition to that, for outpatient expenses, Part B of Medicare is going to charge you an annual deductible once a year. And that this year, that deductible is $226. So I illustrate this by adding up the 12 months of Plan G premium 
plus $226. That is the most that you're going to be socked with in a year of huge medical expenses. Now, let's suppose that you had high deductible plan G, a much less costly insurance plan, and you wanted to uh, see what the worst case scenario would be. Let's suppose you got run over by a herd of elephants. Well, what I do is I take the 12 months of high deductible plan G premium. That is a very small amount. Often it's less than $30 a month in some states, might be less than $50 a month in some other states. 12 times that monthly premium shows you what your premium for the year would be. But now you also have additional coinsurance with HDG or high deductible plan G. That's what keeps the premium so low. So the additional coinsurance out of pocket limit this year is $2,000. Seven hundred dollars, and when people describe the high deductible plan, they say, "Wow, two thousand seven hundred dollars! I don't want to write a check for two thousand seven hundred dollars. I don't want that plan." But here's how to calculate the actual risk: it's not twenty seven hundred dollars. It's not a deductible. It's coinsurance, and the the uh, actual amount is going to be. minus two elements. First of all, you subtract the $226 Part B annual deductible because everybody has to pay that. So it doesn't matter whether you have Plan G or high deductible Plan G, that $226 in a year of high medical expenses, everybody is going to have to pay that in cash. There is no insurance for people born after 1955 that covers that item. So right away, I subtract $226 from the $2,700 to level the playing field. Now we're at $2,474. The other item that I subtract from the out-of-pocket cost during a really bad year for somebody that has high deductible plan G is the savings in premium between plan G and high deductible plan G. Often, that could be $100 a year. I mean, $100 a month, which would be $1,200 a year. So let's say that uh, you have saved $1,200 a year by purchasing high deductible plan G instead of plan G itself. Then you're at $2,474, subtract $1,200, and you're at $1,274. That's your extra risk during a very bad year. So let's say $1,300 to round it off. What you've got is a very low premium that once in a while may cause you some additional cost if you have a bad year of high medical expenses. But in most years of normal expenditures, you're going to be saving a ton of money because high deductible plan G is so much less expensive. And that's what this page explains. Now, the third page in the um, the quoting uh, packet that I send to a potential client shows the actual computations for Plan G and high deductible Plan G. I take off of the chart I've given, I take the the cheapest Plan G because that's pretty much what somebody would choose. And I compare it to the cheapest high deductible Plan G because that's also what I would recommend that somebody choose. And when I have those two uh, on this explanation page, I have the computations of uh, one year's worth of a Plan G premium and how much they've saved over uh, the Plan G if they go with high deductible Plan G. And then in the worst case scenario, what if you have massive medical expenses? Well, you're going to have to pay Plan G premiums plus that $226 Part B deductible. But if you have high deductible plan G, there's going to be some added coinsurance. It's not going to be $2,700 because you're going to subtract the $226 Part B deductible. Plus, you're going to subtract the savings. By having taken plan G, you'll have a monthly savings. Uh, By the end of the year, it'll be 12 times the monthly savings. And you subtract that from your $2,700 $2,700 to get the true amount at risk that you uh, have with plan high deductible plan G. And the whole point is 
High deductible plan G's risk is not $2,700 as they would have you believe it is much less than $2,700. And it could be very reasonable when you compare it to what you used to have for a corporate uh, medical insurance plan. And the final page is a chart that I'm still working on, so it's not real pretty yet, but it shows the four different versions of Medicare coverage that one might have. The first one, no Medicare at all. That means you have to pay all of your medical expenses. And the second uh, segment of this chart is if you have only Medicare parts A and B, but you don't have any Medicare supplement, then that means you pay uh, the the first $226 for outpatient uh, treatment, and then you pay 80% of everything else outpatient for the rest of the year. You actually don't pay that. Medicare pays that. You pay 20%. So Medicare pays 80% of all your outpatient treatment, and you pay 20%. If you have Plan G, which is a little on the pricey side, you pay the $226 deductible, and then Medicare and your Plan G pay everything else for the rest of the year. But let's say that's a little rich for your blood, and you want to get the same kind of protection with a smaller monthly output outlay. <clears throat> well, then what you do, uh, the final segment of this drawing is an illustration of Medicare with high deductible plan G. And that shows you paying the first $226 and then paying, you pay 20% out of your pocket for a smaller period of time. And eventually it goes to 100%, just like the plan G, but you've had some cost sharing and that keeps the price of the high deductible plan G much, much lower, much more attractive. So that is a four page packet that I send to my potential clients. And I explain it to them in a letter. I say, here's the, um, here are the contents of the first um, item, the first uh, uh, amount of information that I've attached to the, to the email that you're reading now. And then Often one of those companies, um, you know, is not familiar to the client. So I include a brochure and a uh, an outline of coverage, which is a legal description of the plan benefits under Medicare. And that's to help a studious person understand what they're going to be getting. And then the last item in a typical correspondence that I have with a a person who's looking for Medicare information is about their drug plan. Now they've told me what their drug plan or what their location is. And so I know what the very cheapest drug plan would be in their location, but I don't know if they've taken prescription medications, if they continue to take prescription medications or not. So I tell them, here is a page that explains the drug plan process. And if you take no prescription medications. Here's what the monthly cost for the cheapest drug plan available in your area would be. Now, why would they want to know what a drug plan in their area would be if they don't take any prescription medications? Because if they don't take a drug plan, when it's um, time to, when they retire or when they turn 65, if they're not covered by a company plan, if they don't take one when they're first eligible, then the clock starts ticking on a lifetime late enrollment penalty. And so I suggest that they take the cheapest drug plan available in their area. And eventually someday they may have need of a different drug plan because they start taking uh, prescription medications on a regular uh, basis. And so then what I do is I take their information, plug it into the government database, and I find out which of the drug plans available in their area would be the cheapest for them. And that includes the drug plan premium plus the co-pays. When you go to the um, pharmacy and you present the prescription and they say, all right, uh, you owe us 12 bucks for this monthly uh, uh, or this 30-day prescription or you know, maybe $25 for this 90 day prescription. That's a drug copay. And I want to make sure that the projection will show the cheapest plan based on the monthly premium plus the drug plan copay. And that varies from one drug store to the next. So when I'm collecting information about drug plans from the uh, potential client, I'm going to ask them what they take. I'm going to ask them where they have their prescriptions filled. And once again, I'm going to need to know where they live 
And I will be then able to tell them what the cheapest drug plan available for them is. If they don't take any drugs, I've already told them in my uh, explanation that the completely cheapest drug plan available to you, if you don't take any drugs at all, is going to be so-and-so. And typically that cost is somewhere less than $10 a month. Often it's in the neighborhood of 4 or $5 a month. In Washington State, it's $1.60 a month for the cheapest drug plan. So that is like holding your right, preserving your right to a drug plan without a late enrollment penalty if you need it as you get older. So that's the, that's the um, packet of information that I send back to somebody. It takes a while to put all that together, and occasionally people have other needs. And here's one that uh, <laughs> um, I've had to deal with recently. It's a woman in Virginia, and she made first contact with me in, I think, late May or early June. And she had a problem. Her company insurance was going to end a month before her 65th birthday. So I had to go out and find temporary health insurance for her. And then she had some other problems and complaints. And then uh, this went on and on. And I got her drug plan uh, started for her. And then I said, okay, now you have uh, looked at all of my suggested Medicare supplement plans. Uh, which one strikes your fancy? Or do you have questions that I can answer for you? And she said, I really want a different company. Okay, so there's extra work and time and effort. So I go out and find the information from this other company. I get all contracted with them. <clears throat> and it's only because she had that same company when she was employed that she liked it. So uh, I said, I will help you do that. And I did all that. And then I let a few weeks go by. And I said, you know, we're sneaking up on September 1st. You better sign those signature pages for the application that I sent you and get them back to me so I can get your uh, your uh, Medicare supplement going by September 1st. And she said, thanks anyway. I just signed up on the company's website a few weeks ago. Okay, so I just want to tell you that if you see that I have been arrested for murder, then this is going to be the reason why. Uh, after having done all the work for this lady, she decided to... Uh, space out. And instead of understanding the fact that I work on commission and understanding that I get a few dollars that don't come out of her pocket, but come out of the insurance company's pocket, uh, she decided to overlook that fact and go right to the insurance company and give them the business instead of giving it to me. And I couldn't help but mention this because I was uh, very perturbed to find that she had uh, just uh, basically <laughs> kicked me over and I am uh, now superfluous. So, Randy, that's a, a downer a way uh, uh, to end this episode. It's uh, Everything was up bright and above board until I got to that part. But I just wanted to remind people that I don't do this for my health. I do it because I like helping people, and I do it because I earn a pittance, a few dollars, every time they pay a premium. And so I'm hoping that people will take that into account when they're uh, asking me for help. So any, any questions? You look very thoughtful and pensive. That's your story and you're sticking to it, huh? For today, yes. Okay, well, I, I do have one thing that I wanted. I was so excited because, as you know, one of my responsibilities working at the Medicare for the Lazy Man is to come up with metaphors to describe the real story behind buying a Medicare Advantage plan. Ooh, yes, yeah, and you've been uh, stellar at that. I have to tell you. So I, I, what I just wanted to let you know, I've come up with a new one, and I wanted to, you know, trot it out to see what the audience thought of it, and and, and include and including you. So in the past, I've I've come up. My first one was Medicare disadvantage, which other people in the podcasting world have taken upon themselves to start using, which is fine. Well, I think you set the stage. I mean, you you came up with it, and then other people started using it. So kudos so to I, you. So I think that's that's fine. And then I came up with my second Medicare scam vantage. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And now here's my new one. All righty. It, it plays on the concept and the name Medigap. Uh-huh. Okay. But the new one that I'm going to coin today that's related to not using a Medicare Advantage plan 
is Metacrap. Okay, well, I believe that's going to be <laughs> that's going to be meaningful for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's Part C of Medicare is the Medicare Advantage program. Yeah, and you have stated uh, unequivocally in the past that it's Part C because it's crap. That's right. So, so then, I, I, so I've taken that to the next step. It's called Part C, otherwise known as Medicare Advantage. Just know it and call it Medicrap. All righty, Medicrap. And not Medicrap Vantage. That's too many syllables, maybe? No, yeah, just Medicrap. Okay, very good. Well, let's keep that in mind because I have a collection of Medicare Advantage articles that would choke a Missouri mule if we had a Missouri mule. And yeah. uh, there is a, a plethora of ill will going on in the Medicare Advantage world. So one of these days, I'm going to be spending several episodes on Medicare Advantage, but I didn't think I would do that today. That sounds like a plan. Well, you know, guess what? Out of time. I know. I out know. of time, out of money. The 75 cents is gone. So I need to land the plane. But before I do, there's a couple things I always like to mention because Doug gets so depressed. I mean, you you wouldn't believe his hangdog face when he doesn't get any email. So reach out. Tell Doug a story, ask Doug a question, do anything, but you can reach him at dbj at mlmmailbag.com, and he will gladly answer your email because he really enjoys working with people and helping them, and that's the truth. And the next thing I always like to mention is uh, he is licensed nationwide. Sometimes we don't mention that enough, but he is. And uh, that's pretty unusual for one person to be licensed nationwide to be able to help you with your Medicare supplement planning. Check us out on our website at MedicareForTheLazyMan.com. We would also appreciate you finding a place or a way to give us a review because it always helps us in the ratings. And Lord knows it's all about the ratings in the world of uh, podcasting. But not last, but certainly not least, is we want to thank you for joining us. You could have been a hundred different places doing a hundred different things and you weren't, you chose to spend a few minutes with us and we certainly do thank you and appreciate that. But as we've always told you, keep track on your wristwatch because we always try to shoot for the same amount of minutes. And that's exactly what we buy with our 75 cents. But if you haven't, you have just spent about 32 and a half minutes with Doug Jones the anti-insurance insurance guy from Oklahoma, no more. Now he pitches his tent up on the high ground behind Cave Creek, Arizona. And most of the time he's up above 12,000 feet, but I'm going to put him in at about 8,500 today in his fortress of solitude. Thank you so much, Randy. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Come back and join us next time, will you please? Bye-bye.